<laughs> it's you and Gizmo. It is, isn't it? Look at that. <laughs> wow. There we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining Have you had a good uh, start to the morning? It's been a little hectic. We were doing the first uh, photo op thing and there was no giz. So somebody oh. had to run and, and find a giz amongst all of this <laughs> chaos well, and madness and everything like that. But luckily he's... He, he's okay. You okay? Yeah, he's okay. There we, go. there we go. Where would we find something like that in a place like this? I'm so, going to put him a little farther away from the water, though, over but, here. Ah, uh, nicely put, done. Put the water over. The, whoa, oh, oh, no, no, no. We don't want to do that now, do we? <laughs> oh, you, th we you think I'd learn my lesson after two films? <laughs> <laughs> so just to start off very quickly, what, what will happen is I'll just have a quick chat to Zach and then we'll open, and open the floor up to anybody who's got questions. So start thinking of your questions about gremlins and anything else that you want to ask. But um, take us back, 1984, first film, Steven Spielberg, Christopher Columbus. It's, how, how did that all happen? How did this take us through how it all started for you? Wow. Uh, wow. That's a complicated question. So let me just give you the simplest answer. I did a lot of plays and theater at school. And I was born and raised in Manhattan, so I'm in New York City. And um, because I was in New York City, that's where a lot of the theater and film and television industry was, New York and LA. If I was in Seattle or if I had been in, you know, the middle of Iowa or something like that, it probably would never have happened. But so I happened to be at a kind of a private school that was kind of known for some of its drama classes and stuff. So casting directors would come there and um, scout for young people. Because at the time, in the early 80s, there weren't really that many young actors. They were all sort of coming up like The Outsiders, right? And Rumblefish and all of those kind of young adult movies were just starting. So I had an agent and I just had, you know, uh, got kind of discovered from doing a monologue in one of the shows that I did at my school. And so they came and, uh, and uh, asked me if I wanted to try out for Gremlins. So I had a bunch of auditions and tried out. And eventually I got paired very fortunately with Phoebe Cates. Um, and she and I knew each other from other projects that we had auditioned for, but not gotten. And so we, we kind of already had a little bit of a positive uh, chemistry together. And I had a huge crush on her because <laughs> I was alive and breathing. <laughs> and m most of America did too. Uh, so when I went in and we, we put our audition on tape, you know, now you have a camera like that that's like all nice and small and compact and sophisticated. But in 1983, it was this huge, bulky videotape monstrosity camera thing. And we would stand in front of it. I mean, it was, it was, it was enormous. And uh, I was very nervous and she wasn't. She was very calm, cool and collected. And I think that when we did our audition together, I think that worked very well because I looked like the, um, you know, our audition scene was a scene where I asked her out on a date. And so my natural nervousness and crush, I think, worked really well because when they sent the tape to Spielberg in Los Angeles, right, you, you couldn't send it via the internet. There was no internet. You had to Federal Express it. That's the across post the country. For, for the kids, for the kids yeah, in that For the like... kids, you know, there's no, no internet, no phones or anything like that. Well, there were tele, telephones, but no <laughs> smartphones. So when he saw the, uh, the audition tape, Phoebe Cates and myself, it, it, and there were a whole bunch of other people on the tape. You know, the, I don't know who they were, but this pair and then that pair and then this couple and that couple and then me and her. When he saw uh, the two of us together, he turned to the director, Joe Dante, and said, you can shut off the rest of the tape. I can tell he's already in love with her. <laughs> so no acting necessary. So that's the secret of good acting. Is so the secret of good acting is to not be acting at all. It's just to actually literally be doing the circumstances of the movie. Of course, when you play a killer, that's probably a difficult <laughs> circumstance to mimic, but you know, there are exceptions. 
So what, what was it like on set as well? Was it like a big family and was it all fun with the, with the animatronics and the puppets and all the rest of the cast? Well, I wouldn't exactly say that it was fun working with the animatronics because it was a very uh, cutting edge technology and there was a lot of trial and error. And the guy who designed Gizmo was a, a young man named Chris Wayless. He, you know, to me, I was 19 and he was 28. I mean, he was so old at the time, you know? <laughs> and I was just like, wow, this guy is so old and crotchety, you know, because he was so overworked. Of course, he wasn't even 30 years old at the time, but you know how, how age is kind of like um, appears differently to you a lot when you're younger. And uh, so Gizmo would break a lot. And uh, he would just, you'd be in the middle of holding him or something and suddenly it would just go ba boing and just like something would snap and his ear would snap off or something like that. And Chris would come over and he always did sort of the same thing. He was under, in fairness, he was under a tremendous amount of pressure because he was in many ways, I mean, Gizmo's kind of the star of the movie. He was responsible for creating the star. So he would come over and he'd go, oh no, oh dear, oh gosh. Oh. And Joe Dante had you know, no patience for any of this. He was sitting in his director chair and he'd be like, all right, Wayless, how long's the delay gonna be? And Chris would be like, oh, I don't know, uh, five hours, six, six hours maybe. All right, everybody take six hours. <laughs> and I would have six hours off in the middle of the day. And so what I would do for fun is uh, I would go over to Spielberg's office because he was away doing Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. But he gave me permission to do, use all of his... Um, he, had an ar he had a small arcade, video arcade, in his office. Um, I don't know if he's ever, Spielberg's ever spoken about this, but he, he loves stand-up video games, or he did. So he had uh, Millipede and Pole Position and Defender and a lot of these early 80s games over in his office. So I'm 19 years old, you know. I don't care, six hour delay over to Steven's office, play Millipede all day. And it was, it was a fantastic time. It was absolutely amazing. And, you know, and then it was funny too, because the secretary would go out to lunch and she'd be like, are you okay alone in Steven's office? I was like, oh yeah, sure, I'm fine. So she'd go off to lunch and I'd like go into his office and the bikes from E.T. were there. So I'd ride around on the bikes from E.T. <laughs> And he had a sled, the original sled, Rosebud from Citizen Kane. I take the sled, go sledding. With, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I would look at it and go, that is amazing. He had all sorts of incredible things on his desk and in his office. So if you're 19 years old, you're making a movie, you're kissing, they're paying you to kiss Phoebe Gates. Do you ever stop and think about that? They paid me to kiss Phoebe Gates. I'm the great, sure greatest gig in the history of the universe. On your first yes, thank film. you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you for your applause. It's appreciated. So, yeah, so it was just a, a, a dream come true, and it, it was just an amazing experience, and it, it was um, unforgettable. Fantastic. So we're going to open it up. Like I said, we're rushed for time. So we're going to open it up to the floor. If you've got a question, if you'd like to come down, we've got a microphone there so we can uh, get it all recorded. So we'll keep talking, but if you want to start queuing up and ask any question you want about Gremlins, about Gizmo, about... Don't there be we, shy. There we go. There's our first we one. We promise we will not make fun of you at the microphone. Okay, <laughs> we might make fun of you a little bit at the microphone, but not really. <laughs> Thank you for breaking yes, the seal. Hi, Zach. How are you doing? Cheers. Good. Yes. My name is Craig, and I just wanted to let you know um, Gremlins is mine and my family's go-to Christmas Eve movie. We watch that every year on Christmas Eve. That's our tradition. And what was your favorite scene of film like in the Gremlins movie, aside from kissing Phoebe Cates, of course? Aside from kissing Phoebe Cates? Wow. Yes. <laughs> I gotta think about that one. Um, well, one of my favorite scenes is one that most people don't know we kind of came up with on the spot. And in fact, it was very strange. Um, <clears throat> About three or four years I, I found up in my attic, I knew it was up there, I found my original script to Gremlins, like the, the actual shooting script with all my notes and everything scribbled in it. And um, I was like, well, I don't need to read it, I did the movie. But you know, I started to like read some of the script and everything. And what was really interesting is probably about 50% of the dialogue in the script completely thrown out. 
just completely thrown out. I'm like, I don't remember ever saying any of this, you know? And that's because Joe Dante would kind of um, want Phoebe and I to make it sort of more of our own. You'd keep this, the same kind of uh, plot points, but you would make it in your own sort of natural um, speech. But he would also do improvisational things, Joe Dante would. So one time he and I came back from lunch and we were walking in the department store set and I saw a chainsaw on the wall and I said to Joe, so what is that? Is that your tribute to Toby Hooper? You know, because the director who did Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And Joe looked at me and he said, as a matter of fact, it is. <laughs> and I said, wouldn't it be cool if like, you know, the thing where they're shooting the darts at me and the, everything, if I grabbed the baseball bat and I had like a baseball bat chainsaw fight with the gremlin, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, be and Joe cool. stopped walking and he goes, that would be cool. And then he looked at me and he went, give me five minutes. And he walked away. And I was like, I didn't know what's going on. And when we came back, he had come up with the, and had spoken to the special effects guys with a rig and everything of how to incorporate the chainsaw baseball bat fight into the movie, which was not in the script and wasn't in the movie. It was just an offhand comment joke that I made seeing a prop on the wall. So in some ways, that's one of my favorite uh, scenes in the movie because it just came from kind of a stupid joke that I made coming back from lunch and it ended up being one of you know a lot of people's favorite scenes in the movie it's kind of cool so nice. filmmaking is a like they say a, a collaborative process I hope you got paid for thank that you, thank you very much for your question our next question Come on, we'll, we'll race through these hello, hello uh, I'm Bobby um, I just wondered in Gremlins 2 what was your like initial reaction to um, a very specific gremlin with lipstick on. What was, what, was, what was your reaction to the gremlin with the lipstick on? Everybody's favorite gremlin. Oh, the, fe gremlin. the female gremlin, yeah. which is now known as Greta Gremlin, although she was not known as that for years until the internet came around and then people started calling her Greta. But if you look at the movie, she's just known as like the female gremlin. She shouldn't actually have a name because if you notice, I think she's the only female gremlin specifically female gremlin in the movie. Well, you know, I don't really have any scenes with her. They're all Bob, her and Bob Picardo, Robert Picardo. Um, but she's definitely, uh, she's definitely an interesting character. <laughs> and um, yeah, she's, she's unusual. And I tend to see a lot of cosplaying of her. Um, and that's Remarkable. That's about as far as I'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah. Like, what was your first thought when you first saw it type thing? I mean, I really just thought it was kind of like, um, you know, Joe Dante takes a lot of his cues from cartoons. He's obsessed with cartoons. He has something like 10,000 original cartoons. He's got one of the largest cartoon collections, I think, in the world. P private. Private. Current. So as soon as I saw it, I immediately thought of the Bugs Bunny cartoon where Bugs gets dressed up as a girl and puts on the big lipstick and stuff like that. So it's really, it's really to me, it's just the gremlin version of Bugs Bunny with lipstick from the old Warner Brothers cartoons. And, and I'm pretty sure that, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure Joe would ag agree with that was largely the inspiration for it which is hilarious, as far as I'm concerned. It's something that definitely sticks in everybody's mind, isn't it? So thank you very much thank for your you. question. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, hello. Uh, this might have already been answered with the chainsaw thing. Uh, that was before I got up. That's but, okay. Uh, yeah, get another question. Don't worry. Absolutely, wanna... <laughs> absolutely. Um, so there's, you found lots of very, very creative ways to kill small green creatures. Yes. Uh, what are some of your favorites? Doesn't have to be ones that uh, were specifically your character, but just any of the characters over any of the two films. For me, it's got to be either your mum blowing one up in the microwave or the shredder from the second, the, bad, the, the new batch. Uh, what was yours? Yeah, the shredder was really good. Um, obviously, I'm kind of partial to uh, using the electric gremlin to zapping hundreds of them all at once. So it's finally, finally, it was something I got, my character got to do. <laughs> 
Um, in the original Gremlins, I actually am the one that, that kills the gremlin in the fountain. When we first shot it, I go diving over the potted plants and I grab the shade and pull it and the shade comes up mm. and it kills it. And they recut it and added the gizmo in the pink Corvette thing and gizmo pulling the shade. And when I saw it at the first screening, I was absolutely outraged because it was like a big heroic moment that they took away from me and gave to Gizmo. And I went to Joe Dante and I said, Joe, I, ca I cannot believe this. That's like, you know, I did my own stunts. I go flying over these rows of potted plants. I injured my shoulder. I gave my blood, sweat, and tears for Gremlins to save Kingston Falls. And then they just, you know, have Gizmo in this pink car save the day. And I said, how could you, how could you do that to me? And Joe looked at me and I'll never forget this. He looked at me and he goes, the name of the movie is Gremlins, not Billy Peltzer's Adventures in Kingston Falls. <laughs> and I was like, I did my Kermit face. You know, when Kermit gets disc and he goes. <laughs> <laughs> I did my Kermit face, basically walked away. Perfect. Well, the car is very iconic, so we did get that. You did get that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is, yeah. it, is it a, a director's cut where you're back in it and... There's an original cut, yeah. Uh, it's been shown very, very few times. It has me saving the thing by pulling the shade, and it also has the legendary um, bar sequence at Dory's Tavern. It's a good 10, 10 minutes longer, Ooh. with like so many more gags in it between with, with the gremlins and stuff like that. And it was just it just went on forever. It was like it was like a, a, a Looney Tunes cartoon in the middle of the movie. So eventually, I think Joe just got annoyed with that and put the Looney Tunes cartoon at the beginning of Gremlins 2. Because he's like, there's going to be a Looney Tunes cartoon in it no matter what. <laughs> so he was just determined to have a, basically a, a Looney Tunes cartoon in there. <laughs> so next question, what's your name? What's your question? Uh, my name's Isaac. And my question is, did you ever think you broke Gizmo when, like, his ear broke or something? Like, did you ever panic, like, you thought you broke it? Oh, you mean, it, you mean in real life when we were working it and the things broke, I thought I did it? Yeah, did, did you ever think that? I always could blame it on somebody else. There was the dog, Barney. I could blame it on him. I could blame it on the new technology. I don't, I actually don't think at any point I did break the gizmo. I, I could be wrong, but I mean, I was handling it, you know, like a precious museum artifact because I was, you know, when you're 19 years old and you have a part like that, the last thing you want to do is get fired. So you kind of knew right away that rule number one was make sure that gizmo was in perfect condition all the time. But yeah, if I had ever broken gizmo, I, I would have been absolutely mortified for sure. Thanks for your question. Homer Simpson, next up. Hi there. Yeah, but my name's actually Richard. Hello, Richard. Hi there. One question to ask, uh, as you heard for the last few years, there have been rumors that they were planning on doing a third Gremlins film. A third Gremlins film? Well, I think we're all up for that if it's possible. Is yeah. there going to be a third one? Well, you would have to think with all of the merchandise that they're putting out now. And I, I have to say, I have noticed there's been a lot of new merchandise in the last 18 months. Like, you know, I've been watching this for literally decades. And so there's been kind of an influx of new merchandise. Um, my girlfriend points it out to me and she's like, did you see this? And I'm like, interesting. You know, uh, when you see like a, 30 to 40% increase in merchandise, it does make you raise an eyebrow. Um, because, you know, these, these corporations tend not to do these things randomly. They tend to have a pretty well-oiled plan behind them. So I just think with, you know, things like the Mountain Dew commercial that came out in America and... Uh, you know, the animated series and things like that, which you guys haven't gotten here in England. You're doing a voice on that as well, uh, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you'd have to figure that 
there has to be something coming down the pipe at some point. It's really just a, not a question of, of whether it's going to happen. It's just really a question of when. That would be my, my guess. It's just a guess, though. Yeah. I have no inside information. Would you like to be part of that if it comes back again? I better come back. <laughs> I better come back or we there's going to be some... We all want to see Billy there's again, There's going to be some serious... There's going to be some problems. <laughs> there's going to be some conversations had, for sure. Have you, have you got a figure of yourself? Is there any sort of little models of you? There is what I like to refer to as a Zaction figure of Billy Pilzer. <laughs> Hey. Uh, thank you very much. It's very early, but it's a great pun. It took me three quarters of a second to think of that, but it was <laughs> presented itself fairly obviously. But yeah, there's a NECA Billy Pelzer Zaction figure that um, you can get. It's, a, it's, it's available online. I don't know if they have them at the vendors here. I haven't had time to walk around. I barely had, I barely had time to sit down, to, to, be, to be fair, as they say down in Der, Derby, Derby. To be fair, I haven't had time to sit down. Um, so there you go. There you go. Thanks for your question, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Actually, so that was my question about Glamorlands 3 as well. So I'm just going to ask you if you had a Greg steak bake. So <laughs> what, what, was what was that? Have you had a Greg steak bake? So Greg's, have you been to Greg's yet? It's a, it's a, uh, it's a patisserie, isn't it? it what, is, uh, what's this Greg's you're talking about? It is, it is basically a, a fast food place that does pasties. Have you seen pasties? Like uh -huh. yeah. pastry things. A sure. Greg steak bake is one of those with steak chunks in. Oh, have you had one yet? Would uh, you Would you like to be taken to? The well, I'll I'll have to try one. <laughs> Has it got any haggis in it? Does it? Okay, cool. Yeah. So after this, we're all going to Greg's. Is that Is that okay? Is everybody? <laughs> we, will, we will treat you. Maybe is I'll give him a Greg's after midnight. Oh no. Yeah, we can feed we can feed gizmos over. So, what, what's, what? Tell us about a few uh, more memories of doing the whole thing because it's it must have been very intense. Oh, sorry, uh, I, did, I did. You popped out of nowhere, out the corner of my eye. I went, go on, go on, watch. Go on then. It's a non um, Gremlins related question. That's but, good. <laughs> um, so I've watched in Voyager recently, and not, noticed you pop up. It, sure. A, a species eight four seven two. So correct. Is that something that you? Engineered? Are you, are you a trekker, or is that just another another gig? Uh, basically, if I'm completely honest, it was another gig. But I mean, I've grown up watching Star Trek. You know, not to date myself, but uh, I mean, I, I watched it when it was on originally. <laughs> you know, back in when I was five, 1969. So I can remember seeing it right when it ended, right when it first went to syndication. And um, one of the first shows that I did for Monopoly events was called For the Love of Sci-Fi. And I did it with William Shatner, and that was very, very surreal, um, doing anything with Shatner. Now, I, I, it's funny because I know his son-in-law, I went to acting class with his son-in-law, Joel Gretsch, who's married to his daughter, Melanie. So I'd heard about him for years, you know, actual stories and whatnot. But then when you come here to Manchester, well, not here, is Edinburgh, but when I did the show with him down, down in Manchester, it was, it was very wild, very strange experience, um, surreal, like I said. But basically, I just did Voyager because I wanted, I saw that there was an opportunity to do three things that I really, really wanted to do. One, I wanted to get dressed up in an ensign uniform. And I wanted the sideburns that, that went with it. Two, I wanted to get a Vulcan neck pinch, which I did in fact get. And three, by far the most important one was I wanted to beam up from the planet to, this, to the spaceship in question. And I have to tell you that beaming up was the single most disappointing thing of my entire <laughs> lifetime. Because the way they do it is they go like this, they go, they did, uh, Tim Russ does the uh, Vulcan neck pinch on me and I go, ugh. And I slumped down. And the director, who was a good guy, he goes, everybody freeze. Now run off to your left. <laughs> I ran about 10 feet off to my left. And they're like, all right, that's it, lunch. I'm like, wait, aren't you going to take all of my molecules apart and reassemble them thousands of miles away? And they're like, no, you're just going to run 10 feet to the left. <laughs> and I was like, wow, such a letdown. <laughs> so yeah, so the Vulcan neck pinch was great. 
the ensign's outfit was great, beaming up. Total bummer. So yeah. Did they still, did they still have two people either side of the doors to open them and close them, or did they have proper? I don't know because I was my character was on a, sort of strapped to a table, oh. uh, being uh, sort of scrutinized and, and analyzed by again Robert Picardo. He hadn't taunted me enough in Gremlins 2, so he ended up being the doctor, unmasking me as a species 8472. Which, by the way, was also a fun experience for me because Kate Mulgrew, who of course plays uh, Captain Janeway, played my mother, which is strange because she's only about eight or nine years older than me. But she always played, tended to play older parts because she has that kind of frumpy New England Catherine hepburn type thing, where she just seems kind of, she plays sort of humorless, more mature characters. You know, she doesn't play the giggly, like, oh my God, she doesn't play anything like that. <laughs> so she played my mother in this Civil War thing that we did, so it was like, it was a lot of fun um, just working with people that I'd worked before. So it was great. It was a great, great overall experience. Fantastic. Oh, very, yeah, very, very quickly. Last question. Sim quick. Um, so growing up, Gremlins, I was always like really terrified of them. But now, like watching it back as an adult, I think they're having like a wicked time. They're partying, well, they are, they're eating, they are. they're drinking, the cinema. Yeah. I mean, the cinema scene has probably got to be one of my favorites. That must have been amazing to film that. Yeah, well, see, the thing about Gremlins is, I mean, it really depends on how you view them. You know, on one hand, they're rather evil. And they do actively murder at least one person, yeah. Mrs. Deagle. Well. They send her through the window. <laughs> yeah. But of course, the screenplay is so good. She's so evil and despicable and terrible. You kind of don't mind that she gets murdered, which is like kind of, kind of dark if you stop and think about it. You're like, <laughs> they just killed her. It's like, yeah, good thing too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that's very kind of subversive thing that the movie uh, does. But from another lens, if you look through it. Gremlins just having a laugh. Having just nice out on the tiles, lives. as you guys say, just for a night on the yeah. town. You know, going to the bar, yeah. getting hammered. Yeah. Having you know, a steak bake. Yeah, just yeah, uh, ha having a Greg's <laughs> after midnight, moving on. You know, it's just what? another day in Gremlin land for them. Wait just a having minute. a laugh. Does that mean that you're the villain, really, of this piece? Kind of. In a way, I am, yeah. What a revelation I'm to just, end on. I'm just blowing up people who are having a good time. <laughs> In a movie theater. <laughs> Fantastic. Did you get to meet Hulk Hogan? Because there's, there's a movie theater bit where it all breaks down as well, didn't it? Yeah. I actually was not shooting that day. And what's weird is, at that time, I was not really even remotely into wrestling. So they called me and said, Hulk Hogan's coming, you know, and it's going to be there if you want to come on the day. And I was like, nah, I'm good. I just didn't, it just didn't do anything for now, of course. 30 years later, I'm like, I cannot believe. I didn't go for the Hulk Hogan scene. But back then, yeah, you, we make foolish mistakes in our youth, and then we rue them to the end of our days. Well, we're going to make up for it now by going to Greg's. Uh, everybody, please put your hands together. I uh, give a big... Big, big, lovely Scottish welcome to Zach Galligan. He is back doing photos, back doing all the signings. If you want to go and see him in one of the halls, Zach, thank you very much.